Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. I am James Just, and with me today is Michael Graves, an at-large here in Sacramento, California for the Libertarian Party of Sacramento County. Michael, there's a question I, many people ask, um, and that's often confusing today, and there was an article that we put, passed around before this about Scandinavian countries don't want you to call them socialists, but yet here in um, the United States, we like to call those countries socialism, socialist-ish countries. So I guess the question is, what the heck is socialism? I mean, do we actually even know what socialism is? At least here in the United States. Well, thanks, James. It's, it's great to be back on with you. Um, yeah, that's an, that's an interesting one. Uh, socialism, you know, there's a, maybe a couple of different possible definitions. I mean, you can sort of, there's different degrees of socialism and, and this kind of things. But I, I think um, traditional socialism, you know, in the sense of like, you know, the United, uh, you know, the USSR, the United uh, Soviet Socialist Republics, right, like a, a, a socialist polity, you would have uh, the means of production are, are sort of owned by the workers or they're, you know, they're not owned by, by capitalists and private interests. They're owned by kind of everybody in, in some sense. Um, and the issue here seems to be that uh, what this uh, uh, fee, that's the, uh, uh, what is fee? It's like Foundation, Foundation for, for Economic, for Economic e Education. Yeah, so these guys, these guys have these really, really fun articles from time to time and uh, kind of a proud history in our uh, libertarian movement. But um, yeah, what this article is talking about is that there is a you know, really strong rhetorical uh, tendency in um, the US and in Europe, I think, to say that, well, uh, the Scandinavian countries are socialist and you know look how great everything is there um, and so you know we want socialism we want you know this is this is what um, yeah people you know people who lean left politically uh, I think a lot of them subscribe to a view kind of like this that's you know that uh, you know we want more socialism because that's why things are really good in those countries, and you know, there's there's various, you know, quality of life measures in this country. But basically, yeah, they're they're doing well in uh, in Norway, Sweden, and I think it's Finland, is the ones that are usually um, considered. Maybe maybe Denmark as well. Uh, but yeah, I, I think the issue here, what they're pointing out in the fee article, is that um, they're really not socialists by the the definition that that I just gave. Right, that they really are capitalist economies. Now, you know, what, what the left wingers are kind of pointing out is that, well, there are characteristics of those economies that are more, you know, more socialist, that have more government intervention, right? And they, they, they really do have higher tax rates and various, various things like that. Um, you know, the, the US, when compared with, I think, I think Europe across the board, and certainly those, um, those Nordic countries uh, has has really a has for a very long time had a quite a significantly lower um, just total tax take as a percent of of GDP. Um, but what the fee article kind of points out is that there's well you know okay yes that's true but taxation is not the only um, component you know not mm -hmm. the only thing necessary to have a have a socialist polity and it's not you know the, uh, having higher taxation doesn't mean that okay there's no capitalism um, here and then they they kind of point to the, uh, these uh, economic freedom indexes the uh, the one I like is the EFI the economic freedom index of the world um, and they kind of point out that like well you know when you look at a whole bunch of other uh, you know that it's it's not just taxation that there are other measures of economic freedom like um, sort of, uh, you know, cl clear title to property and, you know, ease of, ease of opening a business, uh, that the, you know, uh, monetary stability, um, so there's a whole bunch of different dimensions and when you kind of add them all up and uh, form this composite index, what you find is that in spite of having higher tax rates, um, these Nordic countries actually uh, have similar levels of economic freedom with the United States, uh, the Heritage Foundation Index, they're actually, they actually outscored the United States in a couple of cases. Um, so it's, it's very hard to look at that and say, you know, 
oh, yeah, they're doing really well because they're not capitalist. Like, that doesn't make a lot of sense if you look at the, the whole picture. Yeah, that's the, the issue with what, what is socialism is people forget that part of the thing with socialism is that it also controls the social aspects of the society. It's not just, we like to view the socialist aspect, at least the left here in the United States, likes to think of socialism as high taxes on the rich, so you have money to give to the poor. And okay, maybe there's, there's, maybe there's some validation for that and maybe not, but socialism actually controls more than just that economy. It controls, it also wants to control the society, the, you know, the outcome of society. And, which for me makes it a very difficult question because the difference between socialism and say fascism is what? Because fascism is the control, is the centralized control of the economy and society, right? You control sure. that. You control that through a centralized authoritarianism. Yeah, fascism has many, you know, kind of a, a laundry list of you know, fifteen or so elements or something that are kind of thought to be integral. But yeah, one of the hallmarks would be this like kind of unholy marriage of uh, government and you know, in the in the fascisms of the you know the the, the notorious ones that we think of. You know, it's it's often the military uh, being you know, kind of like completely not separable from the the so-called private interests and the, the corporations and stuff. Yeah, it's you control the what's it, you control the economy and the culture through regulation, I think is, is what the difference between fascism and socialism. And socialism is you control it directly, right? You you ignore the it's not necessarily through regulation, you directly control it. it, it it's a good, kind of a distinction without a difference, right? If you're controlling well, it through regulations or controlling it like this through the Soviet model, where you just essentially beat people. Well it's complicated. I mean you 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 know um, I think in principle, right? I mean, to give uh, you know our you know dear Marxist friends their due, um, you know, it does seem to me that's what's proposed in Marx is more of a you know a truly like workers' democratic process or something where they you know you, you have and and they they kind of almost tried to do this in the Soviet um, example for for an entire minute where they you know they you had a these small Soviets and then they were going to hold um, an election, um, but but what actually ended up happening is, uh, like in practice, the government took control, right? That it, it ended up being, um, you know, we can't trust like the workers down there in the little, you know, Soviets and the, you know, out out, you know, yeah, well, ha ha having you know collective ownership of the shop or you know the factory floor or whatever to make the right decisions because you know they might make capitalist decisions or they might want to use money or you know like any you know they're, they're going to go off and do things that are aren't communist so in order to um, make sure that you know we're really going to be communists here what they had to do is um, impose it from the vanguard party the the Bolsheviks and they they um, kind of said no you know it doesn't matter what the the outcome of your little, your little election down there is you know the the Bolshevik, the Bolsheviks have to win basically, and the, um, uh, and so you you have yeah th that that in practice to have extant socialism. I'm not sure if it's always true at every scale all the time, but yeah, in practice, it seems like what happened historically is that um, for a, for a whole country, you know, a big polity to be socialist, um, it had to be imposed from an authoritarian structure and. Yeah, and anytime you impose any structure, whether it's actually authoritarianism or even imposing democracy, doesn't work, right? We've seen that time and time again. You can't impose things because you don't have the buy-in from the people who actually need to agree with you. Right. Well, that's that's kind of the issue. Is that you know what you have in, um, by, by contrast, what you have in uh, capitalist structures is voluntary arrangements, right? Like you you know you go and you. You are employed by a, a company, or you buy, or you sell something, um, and it's it's voluntary. You you know they can fire you, but you also don't have to take the job, and you don't have to buy anything you don't want to, and you don't have to sell anything that, that you don't want to. And that's um, yeah, that you, is. And you can change jobs anytime you want. You don't have to go ask your political commissar to say, "I don't like working at this factory. I want to work at the one down the street." Right, it, but I mean, you, there is an open question of you know, could you have a a voluntary socialism, that's sort of an interesting question. But, um, you know, to my mind, that means, okay, that, you know, that's certainly not the Soviet model because people who, you know, don't want to go be 
socialists and and live on you know workers collectives and and what have you uh, communes if, if then you would you know it's not voluntary the moment that you have to do it so then right. i would be free to not do that and you know i don't th the result would not be everyone is is socialist i mean there really was this um historically this really universalist i really think that's part of the poison is this universalist vision that well you know capitalism is clearly evil and worker cooperatives are you know that's that's much much better even though i i don't find that at all obvious uh and uh therefore everyone's going to go you know capitalism is going to get you know thrown into the ash bin of history and and uh uh, you know, we're, you know, everyone's going to be socialist, and you know, if we gotta, ha you know, break a few eggs to to bring about, you know, the first few socialist countries, well, that's just the direction everyone needs to go. I mean, this was always a deeply, deeply morally bankrupt approach. Yeah, and the interesting thing when you compare capitalism to socialism is, I'm not entirely sure capitalism is actually a proper is a proper um, explanation. We think of capitalism as a system that's controlled, but it's not controlled. It's more of an explanation than a system. It's mm -hmm. an explanation of what kind of naturally happens when people are allowed to kind of freely engage in, in commerce. Capitalism is kind of an explanation of that. Um, so, sure. and while socialism is a centralized control. So if you're, if you're someone from, who's thinking of a, social, a central control mindset, then yeah, of course you're not going to like capitalism because there's no, there's literally no control on capitalism. Capitalism is, the, uh, is kind of uncontrolled. It's the, you know, we call it the free market, but you know, markets aren't always free. They are can, they can be manipulated or guarded, or, mm -hmm. or, but capitalism is a way to explain that. And so, it's yeah. I, I think I think like to think is capitalism more of an explanation of what happens. And we think of when we compare capitalism to socialism, we're actually not comparing apples to apples. We're comparing apples to basketballs, and <laughs> you know, yeah. You're, yeah, it's a it's a poor comparison. Sure, sure, that, that's fair. And I I think yeah. So again, I think um, the question of yeah, you know, imposing authority and control over people's economic affairs is an interesting one because uh, uh, yeah, it's sort of like you know. Workers owning the means of production is not, you know, does not inherently have to be authoritarian and imposed. But it's just that historically, when we got, you know, uh, when we tried to make an entire country be arranged that way, it was done in an authoritarian way. And I think the reason for that is because if you're not going to impose it, then you have to accept that some people um, are not going to want to go live on the commune, like, like I said. And so I. Uh, yeah, and, and that's the thing, in a, in a capitalist, in a society that experiences capitalism, you can create your own communes. You can create your own communes. You can create your own workers. Yeah, they've, they've existed. Workers. They, you they, can co -op. they exist now. You know, there's not maybe that many of them. But, uh, yeah. but um, you can have your worker own group. You know, this grocery store I stop at, you know, every, every 20 minutes over the air, they say how proud they are of being a worker owned grocery store. I think that's great. I think that's <laughs> totally, that's actually, it is, it's, it's a worker cooperative operating capitalistically. Right. It's, it's the workers um, getting together to actually do what many people say they want workers to be able to do is to, to gather their own resources, build their own businesses and receive the benefits from that, from that business right. rather than shareholders. And well, more power to them. Just don't force everybody to to, to live in, in your absolutely. In your I, I completely agree, and um, yeah, it's it's just very curious. So when we get into this question of um, you know which countries are the socialist ones and what is socialism, and you know is socialism you know really great or should we be afraid of socialism or you know what do we how do we think about that? Um, like I would first say yeah, the Scandinavian countries there you know they might have you know, taxation and some, you know, sort of corner socialist elements, but the bottom line is they don't have, they still have private ownership of the means of production, right? You still yeah. can, can go, whoever wants to can go buy the factory voluntarily and um, it's not, uh, there isn't any authority that says you're not allowed right. to they do may, that. You may have some restrictions on you, but for the, especially in most of these socialist countries, as you pointed out, they're more economically free than the United States is. So. There's no way they can well, be socialist. socialist country. The ones they're saying are socialist. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the ones that are actually socialist, um, right? I mean, again, there's kind of like, 
you know, voluntary socialism, but that doesn't seem like that's what they're talking about, though, right? Because they're, they're saying, well, no, but we want um, really high taxes. We want to, you know, tax the rich, and then we want to have, um, you know, a government directed uh, welfare programs and health care and all these things that the government's going to do. I mean, is that, well, okay, if that's, you know, if government directed socialism is what we're talking about, then then yeah, then the one the countries where that's really been implemented, it, you know, usually it, it takes the form of we're gonna, you know, like in in the USSR yeah. and, and certain other we're gonna nationalize, you know, all the factories, right? Venezuela, we nationalize the oil companies. We're 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 nationalizing, you know, people who used to own this thing. Now the government owns it, yeah. right? And and then they what usually happens is they mismanage it because they don't have profit and loss incentives to and then. Uh, there is, in some cases, uh, there's been really tragic uh, physical privation, right? Famines uh, in, uh, yeah. you know, the Eastern Bloc, and I mean, this is this is just uh, well, because these decisions are no longer made based upon, hey, how do I sell my products to the most people? Avoidable it, human, you know, they're, they're decided because it, yeah. some guy down there has uh, an agenda that's got nothing to do with making sure everybody's fed. <laughs> so I yeah, think and I the, the, the country my uh, grandparents came from is uh, is still called the People's Republic of China, and uh, you know they my family left before the Great Leap Forward, which was a famine in China. Um, they had uh, you know they were they were you know they had these communists with the, these uh, five year plans they had in the USSR, and they they had something analogous in China as well, I think, um, where they were kind of. Uh, yeah, you're gonna have a commissar, and you're you're gonna meet the grain quota, and it's it's um it's not it's not really the workers down at the bottom, you know, directing everything. It's it's someone who's you know appointed in the stead of the workers, you know, to to you know, uh, but by the authoritarian government is appointed, and this is the commissar of grain, and now we're all gonna do what the commissar of grain says, and then, you know, if they don't meet their quota, they don't know what to do because they don't. There's no mechanism for them to. You know, find someone better to manage it. There's no competition. Yeah, and um, what ends up happening is you end up selling your grain to the, you end up giving your grain to the state, and then you get maybe get some of it back. <laughs> to, yeah, I mean, to feed yourself. Chairman Mao put, you know, implemented this. Uh, they, they were doing, uh, you know, they were saying we're making so much, you know, iron. We, you know, Chinese iron, iron production is up, you know, a zillion, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot. And then, but they were making this uh, pig iron with this like kind of like household process, and it was it was really pretty industrially useless, yeah. right? But he, you know, the person he put in charge, or made, I don't know if he made that decision himself or what, but uh, they don't know that that's not a good decision because they don't, and then when they get it wrong and a bunch of people, you know, and pe you know, people could have been out you know, working in the fields and you know, growing more food um, and they got directed to do something else and then that turned out to be a very big mistake. And the people who make that decision, there's no profit and loss test. They don't lose their job, right? Yeah, or they take out the, they take the um, they take the farmer, they send him to the to the to the city to work in factories, and then they take students from the schools, and they go and put them in, and they go put them on onto the farms to raise <laughs> to work in farms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they were wonder, doing that too. And yeah. you wonder why none of it works. <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of baff, you know baffles. Uh, yeah, it's kind of common sense. You know, it just doesn't doesn't pass the common sense test. But it that's. Um, the, the whole ideology in certain regards, in certain regards, I think, all, you know, doesn't to begin with, the, doesn't pass common sense, common sense test, test, so it's kind of... Uh, well, well, before we kill this thing to death, we, we're going to move on. Um, yeah. Another thing that's not passing the common sense test is the peer review stat, the modern peer review okay. um, issues, right? Uh, peer review has been an abject failure over the last, what, 15 years, 20 years, maybe even since its entire inception. You know, back in the days when Einstein, Einstein's original um, manuscript was never peer reviewed. He sent it out to a handful of people, a mm -hmm. couple people who he knew would disagree with it, and a couple people who he knew would, would likely agree with it. Mm -hmm. He sent it to them for comment and for, to, to read over, and, but it was never published. It was never peer reviewed. And I think we've outsourced to this peer review process. I'm going to use quotes because peer review, it's, we've outsourced our um, understanding. Rather than actually look at a study, say go through the, you know, okay. instead, of, instead of you read the abstract, then you go through and you read the, um, the process. You know, how did you actually come up with this data? Right, that tells you if it's 
if it's a valid study or not. You can say, oh, it's 100 people. Well, then it's not valid. It might be interesting. It might help lead me to a, a future study, but I, I can't actually make any decisions based upon of, of a study with 100 people. It's not big enough, right? Mm. The only decision you can make is, is there something more interesting to study? And a lot of the times these things get peer reviewed, they get printed, but they're completely useless. Sure, and, I think it's not too hard to find uh, examples like that. Yeah, the, the peer review process, I mean, I, I would probably defend it a bit. I would say that, um, you know, overall it's a pretty good, pretty good process. But yeah, there, there is this issue of, you know, just because, you know, it depends how good your colleagues are. Just because 100 uh, people in that field, you know, reviewed it and they all said, yeah, this is a, this is a great paper, that doesn't, you know, it depends. It might, it might still be pretty bad. Well, um, and also, the peer review process actually doesn't tell you if the paper is correct or not. It just, theoretically, it tells you if it was done and done properly. Yes, everything, the, right. the, the data was done properly, it was data was collected and analyzed properly. We don't have an opinion off we agree it or not, but it was done properly. And so now it's, it's out to send out for other people to right. read well, it. Right, well, I think it was, peer review is supposed to mean that the people in that field looked at it and they didn't find anything wrong with the methods that were used. Right. Right, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the conclusions that are drawn might not be correct, or, you know, there's, there's a couple of places where um, you, you might not get the best answer, and that, yeah, you're right, that's, that's just because you pass peer review, that doesn't mean, you know, and, and we, it's and part gospel of this, or something. And part of this, again, is part of the problem with our media, like we go back to the media again, is they promote these things as true. Right. Well, it's been peer reviewed, so therefore oh, it's yeah, true. Oh yeah, no, they're very Rather reliant than, on you know. Experts said this. So experts said chocolate was good for. Experts said chocolate was good for you, and so now six months later, experts say chocolate isn't good for you. Sure. <laughs> and, and or one one year butter's good for you, next two years later butter's bad for you, and then two years later butter's good yeah, for you. Yeah. So again. I think the issue here is, um, I think what this article is kind of saying is that it's. Uh, yeah, it, it's not. It's not necessarily that peer review is useless. It's that. Uh, you know, people kind of use it the wrong way, that you, you're kind of uh, saying that, okay, it's peer reviewed, you know, pe people thought this paper was okay, so now it's true, right? Yeah. And whereas like, all it says is that, okay, like the study's internally consistent and this set of data was collected, you know, I mean, it doesn't, it probably still needs to be repeated, probably, you know, there's, there's lots of holes you can still put on it. So that it's kind of, um, unfortunately, it's been used as an excuse to suspend uh, our natural skepticism. And that I think is unhealthy. And it's also created this strange, this strange dichotomy in science where people are actually now working to produce papers rather than working to produce education. Oh right? yeah. And so, the, so they're trying to get their papers, you know, peer reviewed and published. They don't even care what magazine it's peer reviewed and published in. It's just so they can go and say, hey, well, I've got this magazine. That's, our liberta that's libertarian economics tells you <laughs> that. Uh, People do what they're incentivized to do, and what academics are incentivized to do is publish more papers. So uh, they find ways to do it. And so I, maybe the thing in the future is we need to figure out how to uh, incentivize educating more children, oh, rather, sure. rather or uh, young adults in the case of universities, rather than you know write more papers. Uh, how do we change that? Now I get it. I get how this happened, right? Because discovery is sexy. Right, it's just like politicians like to uh, create new programs because creating new programs is sexy. It's easy. Right. It's easy to get funding. And, for and new programs. sometimes you really do want to learn from from that person who is the luminary in that field and the person who can find the new discoveries and write the best, you know, most insightful papers is often not the best teacher and vice versa. Right, the greatest teachers and lecturers might not be the same, not necessarily be the same people who are out there doing, you know, who. Why, why would they be? It's, it's yeah, uh, you know, there's overlap, but, but if you're if you're spending your time set. if you're spending your time educating kids, which you know I think mo most professors should spend most of their time doing, that's different than a researcher researcher who's researching cover cancer discoveries and or right. cell dynamics. Different or, skill set, yeah. It's a, it's and as we you know again, libertarian economics, there's trade offs, right? If you're spending all your time being really good at this thing, how good are you really going to be at? Uh, this other yeah so what, so in theory what you need is the researcher teaches uh, teaches the professor who then teaches the, the students right that's theoretically how it should work sure but it's kind of broken down somewhere and because that's kind of how it used to work right 
is you'd have educators would learn from the from the mm. from the researchers and they would teach the students but they'd also teach them with caveats this is the current understanding and nowadays we're teaching people with oh this is what it is and i think that's another danger that we've gone down yeah i think you're it's just uh that the problem you identify is is just in the structure of academia it doesn't have to be that way but that's that's how yeah every every academic department is structured that you know everyone is supposed to be a, re a researcher and a teacher both you know it's kind of like in um uh it's it's kind of like in the tech companies when you have someone who's uh, a good uh, really crack programmer uh and then they get promoted to management it turns out they, oh they're not really good talking to people they're not really good with people they're not, not a great manager um but you know there's this well the only way they get paid more is to go into management. So they get shovel these guys, force them off into management. And then finally, these organizations, it took them a long time, finally started to figure out that, hey, maybe that's not a good use of you know, the, the, the talents and the resources available to us. Maybe some people, you know, we can just pay them more and they stay in, and work on the product and make really good product. And we make a path for them. And then there's a parallel path and not everybody has to do the same thing. Yeah, because managerial um, skills are vastly different than programming skills. And oddly enough, one of the things we don't do is we don't teach people how to be managers. We just don't. We, we, the, yeah. we get, someone who's a good programmer, they, they kind of get to be the lead programmer, but they're still just doing programming. And then all of a sudden, we put them in a manager position, and they say, okay, now you're really good at that job, so now you're going to manage. You're no longer doing that job. You're going to manage people who do the job you used to do. Right. And, then, and it's just a different job. It's, it's a vastly different job. And the thing is, they're good at that old job, so they end up micromanaging, which is the worst thing you can do as a manager. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, so, and we never teach them how to actually be, make that transition from you're no longer the worker, you're now responsible for the workers. You're no longer responsible for the work. You're now responsible for the workers. And we don't teach them that. As, as a culture, we don't teach them that as businesses. It's true. Yeah, there isn't a... And that's a massive business failure. We can't, I'm not gonna, you can't blame education. You can't gain, blame government policy. We like to do that a lot here. No, this is a <laughs> pure business failure. I think, yeah, well, I, I think there is, yeah, probably an unmet uh, need for, yeah, so somewhere where you actually get trained to do management you know like like a programming boot camp but for uh, hey i'm gonna go be a manager now like what, yeah. you know what am i what, what kind of people skills do i need how do i how do i run a good team you wouldn't ask um, someone to build a website teams. without giving them some training right. you wouldn't ask someone to run a database without giving them some training yeah, but yet you correct, ask people to be managers without giving them my some experience training. has been like that as well that you you stay at the outfit long enough and then they move you over and okay now you're in, you know now you're managing other human beings and um, yeah, and, it's probably not the best approach. And you may not be, it may not be your skill set, or you may have that, you may have that skill set inside of you, but unless someone teaches you how to do it, you know, it's just like anything else. It's just like riding a bike. You know, managing other people is no different. You have to kind of learn. You're going to fall a few times. And, you know, speaking of falling, we're out of time. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, thank you, Michael, for being here. We want to thank Access Sacramento. We want to thank you, viewers. Thank you for, to our viewers and for please joining remember. us for this discussion of socialism and management and peer review. Yeah. I hope everyone had a very engaging time. <laughs>